And lo and behold, it is Easy Company, the 506 Parachute Infantry Regiment that is able to get up there and command the Eagle's Nest. Now it is this brilliant, um, this is Hitler's private residence overlooking these Alpine valleys. To the north, you have Munich. It was built for him as a birthday present. Easy Company occupies the Eagle's Nest. They find Hitler's personal photo albums. This is where, um, you know, um, the British um, and Neville Chamberlain sold out Czechoslovakia. It's very strange. The only way to get up here, the fastest way, is an elevator. 700-foot um, elevator made out of gold, and Hitler was afraid of heights, so let's make an elevator out of a heavy um, um, mineral. Anyway, you get up there, and the whole town is very creepy. Um, this was built um, um, as a birthday present for Hitler. The town, the only way you could get up there is if you were a high-ranking member of the Nazi party. So it's the one place you couldn't say, oh, I'm not a Nazi. I'm, I'm not a Nazi. It's creepy. It's still there. It's got that creepy Nazi feel, but you have to go look at it. And a lot of the guys were scavengers. A lot of the guys stole many things. But I was fortunate enough to speak with the legendary um, Major Winners, and he said he didn't like steal or take or commandeer a lot of souvenirs. He just had a couple things. One of him was a pistol given to him by a surrendering German general. But he had two complete table settings from, you know, tea and coffee cups to saucers to bowls, spoons, bread plates, dinner plates, you know, forks, knives, spoons. And they all had A.H. stamped in them. They were from here where he got here. It was Adolf Hitler's personal silverware. And I said, Major Winters, I, I get it that you can put them in the dishwasher and you can throw them, you can hand wash them, but don't they still have Hitler cooties on them? He said, you know, it's very, well, Bill, let me tell you. I eat off of them a couple times a year on every Jewish and Christian holiday from Passover to Easter, to Christmas, to Rosh Hashanah. I eat on them one last little bit of a heck you to Adolf Hitler. And you know what? I get it. And that was about as harsh a language as my man um, would use. So you go major winners. So um, we're going to back up a little bit. And we're going to go to April. What is Hitler doing? Hitler, after the Battle of the Bulge, is going to move back to Berlin where about a month later, um, Eva Braun is going to show up. And he moves from the right chancellery to the Fuhrer bunker, the safety spot in Berlin. Now, in a complete fantasy, um, he is in command in Berlin, where about 15 miles away in the town of Zosen, is his commanders. Rather than move with them or move them here, he makes them travel these 15 miles under Soviet artillery fire twice a day. This just goes to show his megalomania and his delusional fantasies. The Soviets are closing in. And Stalin ordered hero of the Soviet Union to take Berlin. And Zhukov says if Modal, um, or excuse me, if Himmler and Hitler don't surrender, I will bomb Berlin to smithereens. Right. Defending Berlin are 200,000 Germans and about 1,500 tanks. Oncoming are the Soviets from one side and the Allies from another. And Zhukov hurls his men in this quest. He is in competition with another Soviet general to capture it. And he absorbs just astounding losses. But to the Soviets, that's kind of the way they did it. And finally, he breaches the intense German defenses on a place called Sea Low Heights, the last high ground east of Berlin. And a stark, raving Matt Hitler was pushing forward, you know, imaginary fantasy units, troops that, 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 that didn't exist, he said he was going to hurl them and defeat the city of spitting and going crazy. He said any, any officer that holds his men back will not live more than five hours because he'll execute them. Well, 
After about a week of this, on April 22nd, Hitler orders his staff to leave. You guys go get out of here. And the next day he turns to Hermann Goering and says, all right, um, you know, we're in trouble. And Goering says, look, mein Fuhrer, you're cut off, you're surrounded. I've got to take over. I'm outside the Soviet um, encirclement. You're cut off, bro. I'm going to take over. And the Soviets are just, you know, inside the Berlin suburbs two days later on April 25th. Slowly, they're encircling the city. And the Germans, you don't like them. But you got to give them credit. Here they fall back, doggedly fighting, block to block, street to street, house to house, floor to floor in these houses, trying to slow down the Soviet advance. And no matter what, they simply just couldn't do it. And so here we are in the Reich's Chancellery. Here's the famous where Count von Steffenberg is going to be executed. And on April 29th, Hitler will call in his secretary and dictate his personal and political last will and testaments. And he names Senior Admiral you know, Karl Donitz as president and Joseph Goebbels, his psychopathic you know, propaganda minister, as chancellor. And then at 1.30 a.m. on April 30th, Hitler marries his longtime girlfriend of like 12 years, Eva Braun, after executing her brother a couple days before. By this time, the Soviets are about 400 yards away. So picture a high school road outside the classroom here. It's about 800 yards long. Cut that in half about where the course building starts. That's exactly about where the Soviets are. Well, Eva Braun will take poison. Hitler shoots himself and Joseph Goebbels and his wife will poison their children and then themselves. And so on May 2nd, the one Soviet I'm always going to shout out, Major Vladimir Nikolinka will climb to the top of the Reich's Chancellery and begin waving the Russian flag. Many people were angry at Eisenhower for not capturing Berlin. He said it would take way too many casualties. Estimates were between two and three hundred American casualties. He was about spot on as it takes 305,000 Russian soldiers to capture Berlin. And here is Major Nikolinka up here raising the Soviet flag over blown out and destroyed um, Berlin. And so here we go. Now, with Hitler's suicide, Donitz orders all of the armies to surrender to the West. And I wish we had um, some better lighting. Here is the message that General Eisenhower is going to send out. And here is literally a copy, I'm going to read it if I can, of the surrender terms. It said, the German command agrees to the surrender of all German armed forces in Northeast Germany, including the Frisian Islands. All hostilities on land, on sea, or in air by German forces in the above areas is to cease at 0800 hours British double summertime on Saturday, May the 5th, 1945. The Germans will carry out this order at once without argument or comment, all further orders that will be issued. Disobedience or failure to comply will be regarded as a breach of these terms and we dealt with by the Allied powers in accordance with the accepted laws and the usages of war. So the war, it looks like, is over, but there's some politicking to be done. Donitz only surrenders part of the German army in the West, facing the Allies. What he wanted to do was conclude peace with the United States and England quickly and then use the rest of his army to go fight the Soviets, hopefully encourage the Allies to help him fight communists. Patton said, you rearm the Germans, give me some of their fighting men, and in 10 weeks, have Doug MacArthur and Nimitz pick me up and in the Pacific. I'll cut across the, the Soviet Union. Donitz had tried something crafty. He sends Admiral Hans von Freiburg to Montgomery's headquarters on May 3rd. 
offering these surrender terms. And here's where, where Montgomery does something good. He says, man, I know what you're up to. You can't do that. Turn around and get your butt out of here. You go back to Field Marshal William Keitel and you tell him no, all right? You're surrendering to everybody and you can't surrender to me. It's got to be total and to everyone. After leaving Montgomery, Freeburg then went to see Eisenhower in Reims and gave him the same terms. And Eisenhower's like, are you kidding me? What don't you get about what I said? I know you just talked to Monty. I just talked to him on the phone. So let me tell you what I'm going to do, all right? So here is Admiral Donuts, and here is Freeburg. He kind of looks like, if you look at him, he kind of looks like the Red Skull from uh, the Captain America movies. Eisenhower says, think again, cowboy. It's either unconditional surrender, or what I'm going to do is all of your German civilians fleeing the Soviets that we're letting pass through our lines to protect them, I'll turn them around. I'll send them back to the Soviets. You stall on me, um, cowboy, and the German refugees, your people are going to pay the price. Is it not good? You, uh, you know, nine, nine, uh, you cannot do this. And I was like, yeah, 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 I can't. I'm not playing, dude. This is what you're going to do and how you are going to do it. So in the early morning, speaking for the Allied Armed Forces at 2.41 a.m. on May the 7th, Alfred Yodel states that effective on May 8th, the German troops are going to surrender. They delayed in time to give Yorgi Zukov, the victorious Soviet general from Berlin, time to get to the surrender ceremony. And at 10.43 p.m., the war in Europe was over. Here is Eisenhower presiding over Keitel and Donitz um, signing the article. And here is the very jubilant um, Eisenhower, his faithful secretary, K. Summersby, and everybody is happy. I'm going to read you Eisenhower's letter from the desk of the chef to members of the Allied Expeditionary Force. The task which we set ourselves is finished at the time has come for the relinquish of combined command. In the name of the United States and the British Commonwealth for whom my authority is derived, I should like to convey to you the gratitude and admiration of our two nations for the manner in which you have responded to every demand that has been made upon you. At times, conditions have been hard and the task to be performed arduous. No praise is too high for the manner in which you have surmounted every obstacle. I should like also to add my own personal word of thanks to each one of you for the part you have played and the contributions, contributions you have made in our victory. Now that you are about to pass to the other spheres of activity, I say goodbye to you and wish you good luck and Godspeed as Eisenhower says his job is done. Now when this is over, crowds begin to gather in London. It's early in the morning outside of the Prime Minister's residence of 10 Downing Street. They're waiting for a Churchill. They're going to wait hours. And all of a sudden there is the, the pronouncement, the German war is over. The famous London newspaper, the Daily Moor, Mir had a cartoon character named Lady Jane who always said that when the war was over she was going to walk, walk stark naked through Trafalgar Square. Well people you'll see in a second defend upon Trafalgar Square and there are all these ladies named Lady Jane and guys start walking through the town square stark naked. Why they did it? I don't know but people were like woo all right not calling out their nakedness but yes that the war is over. And a wave of singing and dancing just happens. It's kind of euphoric. It's just spontaneous and organic. Outside of Buckingham Palace, people scream and shout, the king and his family come out eight times. Bonfires are lit. Searchlights turn on. Blackout curtains are ripped down after six years of having London being blacked out since the evacuation of Dunkirk. They have reason to celebrate again. Here they are at famous Trafalgar Square and some of the aisleways they made for the Lady Jane Walkers. The people of London couldn't be more happy. Victory over Germany, May 8, 1945. You know, the king comes out and the, 
you know, the Queen and Churchill, and uh, the big question for you is, which one of these two is the current Queen? Oh, it's this one. All right. They're there. They're pumped. They're happy. Look at what's going on. And in France, the Paris newspaper prints the word peace in letters six feet tall. It just dominates the headline. Thousands of Allied aircraft fly over the city that had been occupied. And they say a party took place that was even more legendary than what Hemingway wrote after the Liberation Party. And everyone's pumped, but Churchill is the first to say, hey, we have achieved you know, a victory over Germany with this big baseball bat cigar, but we are still at war in the Pacific. Um, don't forget about that. So everyone's happy, and here's the, you know, the Paris Peace you know, headline. We have done it, we have done it. Now in the United States, we all know there's a ticker tape parade. Um, you know, wish we could have that right now. Hopefully we'll have the same thing after this epidemic is over. And the ticker tapes are going in St. Patrick's Cathedral there, right down the road from 30 Rock, is overflowing with people, and people are pumped and happy. But President Truman has to echo Roosevelt's word and says the war is only half won. We've got to remember about the Pacific. And when it's all said and done, the German army remained formidable, a tough obstacle defeat until the very end. But from North Africa to Arnhem in the Netherlands, right, these lightly held German positions who were still hanging on, these werewolves, when they just tried to resist, were defeated with the utmost swift and total violence. And so peace comes once again to Europe, and the rebuilding has to happen in the occupation and the war crimes trials. But for now, while the Americans enjoy the celebration, we still have a war in the Pacific. So the war has ended. VE Day will be proclaimed today. But over in the Pacific, there's a bunch of Marines on Okinawa going, yippee, skippy for them. That's awesome. But they're not here. And we've still got to grind on in the horrific, nasty battle of Okinawa. Maybe we'll do the Pacific Theater and Lecture Series next year. And we're going to end on the famous iconic photograph of the naval officer kissing the, the nurse. Shout out to all nurses and pharmacists and first responders here getting the famous kiss um, on Broadway, symbolizing that the war is over. So guys, thank you for tuning in. I know this is not optimal. I would love to see you guys in person. We'll schedule a date where we'll put this presentation up and we can ask questions. Thank you again for coming out this year, and I hope to see you guys again next year. Please bring a friend, and good night, guys. We'll talk to you soon.